follow KSPR Early Warning Weather with meteorologist Jennifer Perez. Heavy rain coming down right now, pretty much right over the Highlandville area, just south of Ozark, near the Branson area. Look at that red right there. We have asked everybody to be out by dark tonight so that if the floodgates open, you're not having to, to evacuate at 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. The rest of the Ozarks still dealing with that heavy rain, and it's going to continue to be that way as we go overnight. An all-out effort to prevent a catastrophe down in Branson. That's where we begin our team coverage tonight with KY3's Paula Morehouse. Paula? Yeah, Ethan, the city put up, Branson put out a call today for volunteers to help them fill and stack sandbags. Volunteers and city employees filled, get this, about 8,000 sandbags, and that is in addition to the 4,000 filled just yesterday. People's homes are being destroyed, and, and the people that don't want to leave their homes are, are potentially subject to danger. So if we can fight whatever flooding and whatever damage to their homes, we can potentially, if not save lives, save their homes as well. So those are the areas that still remain under flash flood warning. Now this continues throughout the overnight for all of the red highlighted counties. It's been a rough and wet spring. All of our offices were impacted. We had one of those floods that, that just it was incredible. And what made it somewhat different was the amount of speed that it came up. Breaking news now out of Stone County where officials have evacuated the downtown area in Reed Spring due to all the flooding. Hey Kate, are you still getting rain now? Yeah, we are still getting rain now and it has picked up through throughout the morning. So take a look at all that water that's rushing over the roads here in downtown. It's just getting worse. We had no idea what it was capable of doing in just a 24 hour period. When we have a storm of this nature that impacts us immediately, we are very fortunate that we have a centralized dispatch center that is here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And in a fairly short order, we're able to get those linemen dispatched to take care of restoring the services. Yeah, well, we found one of the areas of the heaviest flooding right now. And emergency crews here are on Spring Road. You can see that the road looks like a river. We just ask everybody to take it safe, take this weather event very seriously. A little over 5,000 of our members were impacted that lost electricity. Now that was not at all at one time because we're talking about a three day duration of those storms. Once I came in, it was Friday night, midnight, and it didn't let off. And then we finally clocked out about midnight Saturday night came back Sunday morning, 6.30, and we worked into about uh, to another 12, 13 hours. They were very busy over that three-day period. We've seen a lot of these type of things, these storms roll through, and it takes a lot of cooperation to get through this. It is truly a team effort. In Branson, some 250 homes had to be evacuated. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers increased the flow at the spillways at Table Rock Dam. Well, as you can see behind me, the spillway gates are certainly open. The Army Corps of Engineers last night around 6 p.m. was releasing about 69,000 cubic feet per second into the waterway below. One of the areas most devastated by the floods was Taney County's Bull Creek Village. The village consists of the 62 homes here. Many of these people are low income. Uh, many of them are disabled. So we don't have wealthy people here but they take pride in their homes. This subdivision has, I'm not sure how many times it probably has flooded. This is as high as I've ever seen it flood. It was about 18 to 24 inches inside our office trailer, which sits about four feet above the ground. Our records are being laid out on plastic tablecloths and drop cloths to try and dry. If we would have just gotten the water in this area, the creek would have handled it. But with all these storms coming out of the north, all these other creeks and springs dumping into it just made it go crazy. It was a lot of flash flooding that washed out poles and then obviously affected their services. It looked like a tidal wave coming up over the berm of the, of the creek and it just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. We worked very hard to evacuate everybody out of the area. Luckily, nobody drowned. Close calls, but nobody drowned. Others in the Ozarks also bracing, bracing themselves for more water. KY3's Paula Morehouse is on the scene with the latest there. Lisa and Ethan, homes that were severely damaged will have days, if not weeks, of cleanup ahead of them. And then still, there are some homes you cannot get to unless you're by boat. I'm going to step out of the way so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. Look at that. That is Lake Taney Como flowing through that house. Can you see the damage here? Their homes have been shifted off their foundations. 
you'll find many areas where houses are literally wrapped around trees. Roads are gone. We have a house that we don't know where it went. The roof is laying on the ground and the house itself was swept down the creek. There's not a trace of that home nowhere, even downstream. It's gone. Literally just gone. There are some people that are still trying to live in these homes. It's moldy, it's nasty, and it's not healthy. We have Tent City, we're calling it. There's about 13 people there, but they don't want to leave their property. They have nowhere else to go. They've literally lost everything. It's very difficult to see how this is affecting everybody. Number one, emotionally, financially, physically, having to live in tents and just try to survive. Our hearts go out to them, you know, as with every storm we've been on. My dad told him, do a lot of prayers. Keep your families together. Love them, hug them, kiss them. Pray for them. That's all we can do. We're here at a scenic overlook in Branson, and down below you can really see some of the impacts of that widespread flooding that hit the area over the past few days. In the background, you can see the Table Rock Dam, and all of the spillway gates are open. Down below, you can see how that flooding has impacted the area. Reporting in Branson, Shayla Patrick, KY3 News. Along with the loss of their homes and possessions, Bull Creek residents also had to deal with a loss of power as floodwaters ravaged their electric lines, which at that time ran underground. We had to shut them off. We couldn't keep the underground hot, obviously, because for safety reasons. All of our underground uh, services are just rim racked, meter bases bent over. It's just been a disaster. And we had transformers that had never been pushed or frankly never been jerked off their foundations and the wire that was in the ground pulled out. I mean, we're talking about water that picked up a 750 to 1,000 pound transformer and was jerking it down the river. This is the fourth time that I know of that we've had, we've had issues with it flooded in here, starting back in 93, and uh, this has been the worst out of the four. People today who live near Lake Tanicomo and other areas were finding out and being reminded of just how quickly waters can rise. The work process started a, probably about a week after the actual flood itself. One of the first things that we wanted to make sure that we do is give the member as much security as they can, especially with people still living out here. One of the things that the linemen were able to do is rush out and put security lights back in in places to where we can light this thing back up to prevent looting. It has been a week since record rain fell in many parts of the Ozarks. A lot of communities are still picking up the pieces. KY3's Jasmine Dell reports from one town in Taney County. Robert Ferg describes Bull Creek Village, his home for the past eight years, as a total loss. Every single house down in Bull Creek. Um, there isn't a house right now that anybody can live in down here. This is not a normal storm outage per se. We're hoping that they'll be able to get electric to us in a month and a half, two months. This underground service that we have in here and have had for a long time is gotten dangerous. And one of the things we focus on here at White River is to make sure that everything is, is up to par, safe. This cable's probably 35 years old. And when it was pushed and pulled, it jerked that cable to where we really weren't feeling very comfortable with electrifying it back. When we open a transformer, it's just, just silty mud. It just falls out. And that's flood after flood after flood. And just folding it all back together, you know, it could have got somebody drastically hurt. We don't want that, and that's not how we operate our system. What ended up happening is we challenged the engineering guys in Branson to come back in come up with two plans, an underground plan and overhead plan. And there's a big difference in cost between the two, obviously. And generally with everything, with the federal government, it comes down to money. And when we told them the difference in money, they said, hey, let's build that back overhead. We were told what we were going to go back with. We weren't given a choice. The idea is that with it being overhead, we've gone from a meter pedestal that's on the ground and all the other underground infrastructure to overhead. The meter loop on the pole and the meter loops are hung higher than normal, where if they get four or five foot of water back in here, that will be all right. It is a burden on the people to have the line go back in overhead. But on the other hand, what it does is gives us the opportunity to operate it more rapidly. We really had to do something different. We couldn't keep it doing the same thing, putting new transformers back in. That's just not fair for the rest of the membership of White River Electric. Definitely trying to be smart with the member's money. Everybody has a stake in it and trying to make sure that things are put back together at you know, the least expensive way 
but the most efficient way. Once this thing gets laid out and we know things are staked out, we know where to put poles and set them, this thing will be lit up with boom trucks and diggers and I think it's going to come out to be one of the best results that, that we've ever seen in a short amount of time. With a smart plan for the future, work began to re-energize Bull Creek. It's a marvelous job that they've been doing. They're here, they're working hard already, and I know they have lots of other places. They're trimming trees, they're getting the poles up. Within probably the first week and a half, we had most infrastructure built. Then it was to the tedious part of getting power back actually to the sites where the residents were. But White River faced another hurdle along the way. Since we were changing the dynamic of the infrastructure here to underground overhead, we actually had to go around and get easements from every landowner in order for us to put overhead on their property and cut trees or whatever needed to be cleared. So we had to do some tracking down. After weeks of collecting easements day and night, line crews finally had permission to run secondary line to the residents. We're having to go back in and dig from each one of our poles into their existing service. Realize you get these big trucks that you see over my shoulder as well. You can't get them behind and between these houses. They got good fences here. We're having to take those fences down. And you have to watch for a telephone. You got to watch for cable. To explain how long this process will take, you really can't. We're trying to, to get it done as fast as we can. And we still have the other avenues of the co-op going on at the same time. After the flood, you know, we had at least two major storms come through the areas. And cause havoc and damage. White River has been doing an awesome job. They've been very patient. They're just as stressed as we are. You only got so much daylight, you only got so many crews, and you try your hardest to do what you can in, in that time period to get everybody back on. While the storms only lasted a few days, their destruction was expensive. So the impact of this disaster over those three days, which is a fairly large number, we're a little over a half million dollars that we've identified so far. The Bull Creek Village portion of that restoration looks like it's going to be around $330,000. That does not include a vehicle that we lost. We have suffered a tremendous amount. Even in Christian County, we lost the truck. We're talking $120,000 vehicle that flooded out. We basically had approximately 41 transformers that were completely ruined. If you start looking at that at, at um, $600 and up uh, transformer plus the cost of installation then that gets pretty expensive. We had 14 poles that were actually broken. Three, four hundred dollars a pole is just the hard cost of the pole alone. That's obviously not the cost to get that pole installed. And then about 243 meters, which were completely ruined or destroyed, three, four hundred dollars for a meter. We have to go out and replace that, so that all costs money. And so then that gets built into the red base over time. President Trump issued a major disaster declaration for Missouri a month after that record flooding devastated much of the state. People in 27 counties can now seek federal help. At the statewide level and at the federal level, they have to declare that you have a disaster in your area. So then that gives us an opportunity to reach out to FEMA and apply for funds to recoup some of our costs. I and mean, then typically for um, restoration, it turns out to be about 75% is what they will reimburse up to. So if we can recoup 75% of that, then it's well worth our time. And we certainly owe it to the membership to do that due diligence to try and recapture those funds. With the application for federal reimbursement in progress, White River also had good news on the work site. Today, the 20th of May, our first member went back in electric service. Their meter's turning. We're tickled with that. We're going to hopefully have three or four more on before the end of the day. And if the rain will leave us alone, we'll have even more. It just gutted me. And then every week, every day, you know, I'm always asking, hey guys, where are we at with this? When are we going to get these things done? And, and to see that today, you know, this is an emotional thing when you actually get to go out and that member gets to flip that breaker on in their house. I think in the long run, whoever remains here at Bull Creek Village, they'll be pretty proud. There'll be a lot more reliability should it happen and it will happen again. Floods will happen, but the power will be here. The White River team and disasters, it's indeed what we were set up to do. White River, this company, I'm glad to work for it. I have never seen how well and happy they make each member. We are genuinely concerned for them. It really is part of our 
DNA and our core values of how we value the membership and how we'll do anything that needs to be done, the can-do spirit or attitude to take care of the membership. I've just never seen anything like it. It's almost awing to see how a company pulls together. Like the promise of the rainbow after the storm, cooperative members can rest assured that when the waters rise and the storms rage, White River Electric will always be there.